Welcome to our guide to Railway Kant. In this video you will learn about What Kant is Why Kant is required on the railway What equilibrium Kant is and how to calculate it And about the difference between applied Kant and Kant deficiency First, let's look at what we mean when we say Kant On the railway, Kant refers to the difference in height between the two rails. This means one of the two rails has been lifted above the other. Let's see how this looks in practice. When the track is straight, the rails are at the same level relative to each other. As there is no difference, this is zero Kant. Curves are where we are likely to find Kant. Here we have a right-hand curve. You can see the left-hand rail is lifted above the right-hand rail. The difference in height between the rail is the Kant, shown here as X. It is measured in millimeters. When the outside rail on a curve is higher, as in our example, this is known as positive Kant. If the outer rail is the lower of the two rails, this would be negative Kant. So now we know what Kant is, but why is it needed? To understand why Kant is applied to curves on the railway, First we need to understand the forces that are acting on the trains. Here we have a train on the tracks. When a train is on straight flat track, its weight acts vertically down. There is no lateral, or sideways, force acting on the train, its passengers, or the rails. However, when a train is traveling on a curve, there is an outward force. This is called centrifugal force. If you are in a car that goes around a corner quickly, and you feel the car roll outwards, with you yourself feeling pushed sideways, this is because of centrifugal force. So on a curve, a second force, centrifugal force is introduced. This acts outwardly, parallel to the plane of the rails and sleepers. This has the effect of pulling the trains towards the outside of the curve. When two different forces are acting on the same object, the combination of the two forces is called the resultant force. Working out the direction and magnitude of this resultant force, from the different forces acting on the same object, is known as resolving the forces. The resultant force is the overall force that the object, in our case a train, will feel. When we look to resolve the forces acting on our train, we are given a resultant that acts between the two other forces. This is a simplified version of resolving the forces, but shows final forces involved. This overall force pushes the train to the outside of the curve, increasing the force on the outer rail. This means the wheel will be pushed up harder against the outer rail, sometimes known as riding the high rail. This in turn can increase the rate of wear of this higher rail. By applying Kant, or raising the outer rail, the direction of this resultant force is moved, in a more downward direction towards the floor of the train. The overall direction of the resultant force, is dependent on the angle at which the train is tilted. This in turn is governed by the amount of Kant applied to the track. This is how track engineers can control or influence the direction of the forces acting on the rails and track. This brings us on to equilibrium Kant. The full definition of equilibrium Kant is the value of Kant for a particular curve radius at a certain speed at which the resultant force is perpendicular to the running plane of the rails. So how does this look in practice, on our train going around the curve? Let's see. A 
Again, the train is on a right-hand curve, with Kant applied. It is experiencing the centrifugal force from going around the curve and a force from its weight. You can see the resultant force, in green is at exact right angles, perpendicular, to the, the plane of the rails, shown here by the dotted line. This means the overall force experienced by the train and anything within it, is down through its floor. This is the same as if the train was on flat straight track. This means the train is running with equal force on each rail. The train is said to be in equilibrium, hence equilibrium Kant. Now we know what equilibrium Kant is, let's look at how we work out the equilibrium Kant value for a particular curve. First, we need to know some key information. We need the radius of the curve, in meters. This is known as R. We need to know the speed, most often the maximum speed permitted, in kilometers per hour. This will be known as VE. In the UK, the speed will often be stated in miles per hour as standard. We need to convert this to kilometers per hour for this calculation. To do this we multiply our mile per hour value by 1.603. So this brings us onto the equation itself. Equilibrium Kant, EQ, equals 11.82 multiplied by the speed squared and divided by the radius. 11.82 is a constant, calculated based on 1432 mm track gauge, the standard in the UK. For other gauges the constant will be different and may need calculating from first principles. As you can see one of the key components of this formula is the speed of the train. This is because the speed at which the train is traveling around the curve, is related to the amount of centrifugal force the train experiences. It is very normal on UK railways to have different allowable speeds for freight and passenger trains. So the same curve could have different equilibrium Kant values. But we can only apply one to the track. It is standard practice to calculate the equilibrium Kant for a curve, using the maximum speed allowable, as this is the top speed a train could traverse the curve. It is key to remember that an equilibrium Kant value is only valid for the speed at which it is calculated. Given that the same curve can have different equilibrium Kants, for different train speeds, how do we decide on how much Kant the curve should have? Before we look at this, we need to introduce two new terms. Applied Kant and Kant deficiency. Applied Kant is the value of Kant physically applied to the track. Kant deficiency. This is the difference between the equilibrium Kant value calculated and the applied Kant on the track. It is standard practice for the applied Kant to be less than that of the calculated equilibrium Kant for a curve, creating a deficiency of Kant. This is where Kant deficiency comes from. Equilibrium Kant, applied Kant and Kant deficiency are all linked together. This is best shown as an equation. Kant deficiency equals equilibrium Kant minus the applied Kant. You may see this in symbol form as well. This will read D equals EQ minus EA. Here, we have the track with the left rail lifted to the value of applied Kant, EA. In the background, you see the pale outline of the track if it was lifted to the equilibrium Kant value. The difference between the two track outlines is the Kant deficiency, or D. With the symbols added, we can see how the equation is formed. So, why do we utilize Kant deficiency? Kant deficiency is used, because applying less than the equilibrium Kant to a curve, means the forces on the train will be slightly towards the high rail. This helps ride quality, as the wheel is forced constantly against the rail. At equilibrium Kant, as the forces are balanced, the train wheels can hunt between the rails. 
This is where they zigzag between the two rails, never running smoothly against one or the other. Having a deficiency of cant also reduces wear and defects on the rails. Specifically these defects are rolling contact fatigue on the high rail and, in some cases lipping on the low rail, as well as side wear. So, looking back at our train diagram, we can see that by applying less than the equilibrium cant, this has the effect of moving the resultant force acting on the train towards the high rail. The force is no longer perpendicular to the plane of the sleepers and rails, as it would be if the track was at equilibrium cant. But, how much is the right amount of cant to apply? After working out the equilibrium cant, now it is time to determine how much cant to apply to the track, our applied cant. Traditionally, the rule of thumb used is to apply two-thirds of the equilibrium cant as the applied cant. However, thoughts on this have evolved and now a more nuanced approach is taken. A range of factors are considered. The traffic mix through the site is the main one. The track might be designed for higher speed passenger trains, but the majority of trains traveling through the area could be freight trains going at a lower speed, for example. If the area is near a station, the majority of trains might be stopping, rather than going straight through at full line speed. How the signaling affects the pattern of train movements is another area to consider. Are trains brought to a stop frequently, waiting for a green signal for example? You can see that there are a number of real-world factors that affect choosing an applied CAN value when designing track. It is not straightforward and draws on the knowledge of the designer or engineer. Knowledge of the operations in the area, as well as the balance of traffic is key. Ultimately, the track has to be designed to be traversed safely and comfortably at the published line speed. However, through the selection of applied cant and cant deficiency values the track can be optimized for the local usage conditions. This will drastically improve the life of the rails and other track components. Thank you for watching. If you have found this video useful, please subscribe.